Okay. So in the lecture, we stop here. And we said one of the, the answers of the questions, the three questions we have, which is where to look for in a line where, well, it's a, it's a head, you, you expect it's going to be in the cap to check it. But then also, the same answer determined if you are missing, in, if you are missing in the cap, and you are bringing this line, fetching it from the lower level memory to this particular level, and we call this a cache fill or a cache refill, where to place it, right? And the answer for both questions is the same, because you want to place it in an entry where later on, when you come to look for that particular line, you also look at the same entry, right? It doesn't make any sense to bring in a line in a set, and then when you look for it, you look for it in a different set, right? Both have to be in the same place. But then there is a corner case. Well, it's not really a corner case because it's not, it's not uh, very rare. But it's corner case from our discussion is that if I try to fill in a cache line from the lower level to the current cache level, and I don't have a space in my set, for example, then uh, I say in my set because that's the general terminology. Like in the lecture, we said set associative cache is the general case. Your set can be the full cache, or it can be a single line. When I say the cache line is not in the set, this also applies to, it's not in the entry for a direct map cache, or it's not in the whole cache for a pre cache, right? So why just saying the cache line is not in a set, it's a mess, applies to all the cache organization, right? Um, so simply, if I if I try to, well, I have, I have a mess, so I went, I have a request from the CPU, from the pipeline, it goes to L1, for example, it goes to the particular set based on the index pets, it's a mess, it's not there, then it goes to the lower level memory, try to bring, fill in this line to the cache. But when you try to fill it in, in, in its set, the set is full, which means it already has, for example, if it were a four-way set associated cache, it has four cache lines that are valid there. What do I need to do? This cache line I must fill, otherwise the mess will not be processed, right? So you need to evade something, right? And this, uh, here comes the point about replacement policy, right? What do you do if you need to replace a line? We said if my set only has one way, which is a direct map cache, then, well, this question is irrelevant, right? Because you know which cache line you're going to evict anyway. There is no decision to make here, right? If it's a direct map cache and you are mapped to only one entry and there is something there, what are you going to do? Evict that cache line and bring the new one, right? So there is no multiple lines to pick from for direct map cache to evict, right? The question becomes relevant if you have more than one way in your set, like just to help you understand what I'm saying, assume again the very simple example of four lines in a, in a cache. If I have a direct map cache, then from my address, this index, when I try to go for the cache, it goes only for one way, for one location, right? It doesn't go for a set. Well, in that case, it goes for a set that only has one way, right? So it, it gives me one location that this cache line must be either there if in case of it's a head or it must be placed there if it's a mess. So in that case, there's no need for a replacement policy, right? Because in reality, if I'm missing, there is some like cache line A in that place and I'm requesting B, I go to the lower level memory, bring B, evict that one and would be. I don't have any other option, right? But the question becomes relevant, or the replacement policy topic becomes relevant, if instead of having one way set, which is direct map cache, you start having more associativity. Like for example, you have two sets, set zero and set one. And then here you have two cache lines, you take your index. Now the index, this is a, by the way, it's a two way set associative cache, right? Because every set has two ways. The index, this index from the bed, where does it guide me? Does it guide me here, for example? Or here? Well, no, it just guides you to what set you need to be in, right? But inside the set, it doesn't say anything. It's fully associated, right? Which means, in reality, if A was here, let's say originally I had A and C here. If A is here and C is here, and then B is a mess, so I have an, the, the same load B, when I come back from the memory, I don't have an answer for which one I should evict. Should I evict A, place B and C, or should I evict C? 
Why? That's a relevant question because B can be here or here, right? It's up to me. So you see why this question is not relevant to direct map cat. There's only one location anyway, right? But right now we have multiple options to pick from. Based on what do I pick, this is the topic for replacement voices, right? And there are some very common techniques that people use. The easiest one, the simplest one, is five. So simply, if you care about locality, the first one that came in, which means the oldest one, is the one that might be better to remove, right? So you need to understand what I'm looking for. I'm trying to look for making the lines. Maybe I should ask you that question. So if I'm picking between A and C, what do I look for? Like what, I'm, what, what do I need in the future? Which one, if you have an oracle to look into the future, we, future means like the coming instructions of the application. Which one are you going to be? What do you think? If I give you a sequence of instructions after load B, based, like what are you going to look for in these instructions to determine should you evict A or should you evict C? Yeah, in the future, right? So ultimately, the best replacement policies, in fact, not the one that uses the one that just came first, but rather the one that is going to be used in the future, right? Because you want to keep that line. Well, what does it mean to be inviting? It means remove it from the cache. So if you later on you access it, you need to go to that main memory, for example, and bring it back. So if you know, for example, if I tell you, in the future, I never need C again, right? So your decision is very clear, just remove C because it's not needed, right? But if I'm telling you, for example, well, I'm going to use C, but I'm going to use C after A. So I have a sequence of instructions, something like this. After load B, I have load A and then load C. Which one also you decide to remove when you access B? That sequence of instructions. Which one I should evict? You only have two options, right? And you can walk through. If I evict, for example, A, then after load B, what's going to happen? Load A will cause a mess. And then you go and bring A and, and replace someone. Which one do you replace? Either B or C, right? And you go again to the same point. If you evict C on the other hand, this A will be a mess. But this load C will be, sorry, this load A will be ahead. But load C will be a mess, right? But even if in load A you removed A and you kept C, maybe in fact when you bring A, it evicts also C. It's a possibility for that. So both turn out to be messes in that case, right? You see? So if you know the future, you can, in fact, take the best decision. What is the main problem we have as architects, as hardware, is you don't know the future. We said one of the main problems of current machines is that you are completely oblivious to the software. It doesn't know the coming instructions, right? What do you do? If I don't know the future, like by now you are computer architects, what do you do? Use the history, right? Like you just look into the history. This is what we have done in branch prediction, right? So you use the history to think of, okay, most likely, I'm going to need A again or C again. And this is the idea of all these replacement policies, right? In the reality, none of them is ideal, right? The ideal one is, tells you what you need in the future. But because this is not, not attainable right now, and by the way, there is an ongoing research. Also some, some companies are looking into this. Is, again, if I can know the future, I would have, so there is a very recent paper, for example, I guess 2022, it won the, the, the best paper award in, in uh, at least it was in the best paper session in micro. Micro is the top venue in, in architecture. Um, so they said, okay, forget about all of this. I'm going to pass in some information from the application that knows this pattern. And based on this pattern, I determine my replacement voice. And they prove that it's an optimal replacement voice, which is clearly optimal because you know the future, right? So it gives you a better result than the, the history, right? But the textbook ones, we don't know the history. Sorry, we don't know the future. I don't know what the software is doing. So my only need is to use the history. How do I use the history? Well, different policies use different techniques. For example, for the FIFO, you keep a list of well, the oldest uh, um, accesses to this particular set and the one that is oldest, you just remove it. Why this might be an indication for the future? 
why I'm removing, why this is logical. Like, just basically just remove that, the one that is being oldest. What do you think? Yeah? It's not really used. Decent, right? So it's, well, but the problem with five is that's not true. Because, and, and, and this is a correct answer in general, but the problem with FIFO, it doesn't take into account the heads. It only looks into when did you bring these lines. So let, let me give you an example. So assume I have a sequence of, uh, of memory accesses that is like A and then B and then C and then A and then D and then A and then E. Okay. And to assume you have a four-way set associative cache, which means you can hold in and all these lines map to the same set. So A, B, C, D, both are on the same set, which means by the time you request E, you already have E and B and C and D in your set because you have four-way set associative cache, right? So which means E would require you to replace some, right? So let's walk through this example because it might be uh, helpful to me. So I need to add a new slide, and then go for a screen. So we said I have A, and then B, and then maybe E again, C, A again, D, and then E. And let's say we have five. And I'm just thinking we have a, a four-way set associative cache. So the first time I access A, I bring in A here, and then B. So it's a mess at the beginning, mess at the beginning. And then I bring A again, so it turns out to be a hit. And then C, which is a mess. And then A again, which is another hit. And then I bring in D, which is a mess. And then now I have E, which doesn't have a place in the cache or in the set, right? So this is my sequence of, these are memory accesses, basically. If I use FIFO, which, is, which, which one came first? A. So if you only depend on FIFO to evict a line, you're going to evict A. Is this a wise decision? A is your most frequent one, right? But the problem with FIFO is that First in, the first one that you bring to fill in the cache, regardless of the hit and mystery, which is too bad, right? So FIFO is not, in fact, a good policy. What is the good thing about FIFO? It's very easy to implement, right? So FIFO is very easily implementable. It doesn't require a lot of hardware uh, costs, but the problem is it's not very efficient because it doesn't take into account the hit locality rate. Good? So that's FIFO. So in case of a FIFO, I'm going to... In case of a FIFO, I'm going to evict A and place E here. Now, to address the problem we just mentioned right now, there is another policy which is more common. It's called least recently used, right? So now, this is the one that is truly takes into account the usability of the line, right? So it, it keeps track of the one that is used, used the least in the current recent time. So how does this really work? Let's go with the same, like once I fill in A, B, C, D again, and E is a mess, I want to replace a line. I want to, between these lines, I want to pick the one that is used, that is used, well, again, the least recently used, which is the, the, the one that is oldest, but from the using perspective, not from the bringing in perspective. Which, which one uh, I can effect based on the policy? B in that case, right? Because if you go back in history, A, so if I want to draw a line, a timeline, D is the most recent used one, but A is afterwards, and then C, then it turns out to be B is the oldest from the usability perspective. So B is the least recently used line. So in that case, you evict B. In case of LRU, you have A, B, C, D, then you evict B and you put it in here. This makes sense? So LRU is very efficient in terms of performance. What is the problem with LRU? It's very, very hard to implement. But if you think about the ideal trivial implementation of LRU, what do you need? How do I know which one is being used recently versus not? Think about an implementation. I tell you, go ahead and implement an LRU policy. What, what are you going to do? Yeah, you use a counter, for example, right? The problem with the counter, given that it's least recently used, this is about time. So the counter has to accommodate for cycles, the current running cycles. Some programs run for a very, very long time. So if you just trivially add a timestamp counter that says, okay, D is used at cycle one. A is the least reason to use, like uh, cycle is cycle, uh, well, I gave a wrong number because one is, so let's say this is 10, for example, and this is, I don't know, seven, this is five, 
and this is three. So look into all of these, pick the one with the least cycle number relative to the current cycle, and then you pick that one, right? But if these are cycle counts, you need very large registers to keep that. That's not really possible when they're going to overflow. There are, well, approximations to LRU, because people don't really store in uh, actual absolute times, because you don't need absolute times. You need only the relative usage according to the current set. So the way that really people implement it is something like a, a linked list, a sorted linked list from a software perspective. You always bring in on top of the list the one that is currently being used, like the most recent one. So if I want to think about an implementation like this, at the beginning I had A, and then B became at the top of the list because it came afterwards. Then now I have A again, so I have to bring in A here. And then C came in, so I put in C here. And then D came in, so I put in, oh no, A came in again, so I have to put A here. And then D came in, so I add D. And then E, so I look into that list here. The one that is oldest is B, right? But the problem with this implementation is still costly, right? Because you need to keep reordering all the time, right? With the hits. So this is why most of the implementations, including all Intel processors right now, they implement an approximation of LRU called pseudo LRU. Something that is not 100% LRU, but it's very close. Why they don't really implement the actual LRU? Because of the hardware cost. Good. We will not go into the actual implementation of BLRU because it might be too complex to think of, but you, you get the, the idea, right? In paper and pen, if I have the low LRU, it gives me the best results so far. But in reality, it's very hard to implement, so I need to approximate it a little bit. Good. Something that might be surprising to you is that there is another policy, which is gaining momentum in, in recent SOC, which is random replacement policy, right? So people say, okay, don't really worry. Just pick any line and then replace it, right? The most recent ARM chip is in fact deploying a random replacement box, right? So why does it work? Because they found that modern applications, again, machine learning, graph processing, they don't exhibit high locality anyway. And then if you save the hardware cost, you add to the replacement policy to optimize some other thing. And then just really deploy a very down replacement policy, it gets better performance. Just let, let's do it, right? So architecture, again, is not a holy book dedication thing that you keep looking into it. Maybe another lesson from this is it's not all the time you want to get the best performance regardless of any other constraint, right? Sometimes it's better to take a more wise decision of investing your real estate, your cost into something that is better easier, simpler to implement, less power consumption, and then just eat up this 0.01 worse performance that doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Okay, good. So that, that, that's a good discussion with how the, um, the cash topic relates to the pipeline. So if you remember the data path and control path we had, we said we access the memory in two stages. One is the fetch and one is the data itself. The one that access at the fetch, which type of instructions, which instructions access the feature stage? All of them, right? You need, because in the feature stage, you bring in the actual bits of the instruction from the memory, right? It's how you know whether you have a, an add, subtract. So the feature stage goes through all the instructions, which means all instructions need to access the memory at least once, right? But then, which ones are accessing the data stage in the, the pipeline? In case of a risk, it's loads and stores, right? These are the memory operations, right? And we said most of the implementations in the L1, they separate the instruction cache from the data cache to reduce the structure hazard we discussed earlier and also protect the instructions from being polluted by, evicted by the data, right? It's related to here. So going back to your question, uh, all instructions are stored in the memory, that's correct, but the memory that is storing the instructions mostly is a separate L1 than the data one, right? Here I'm talking about ABCD as like abstract requests which are, can be instruction misses with what we call instruction fetches, or they can be uh, data fetches, right? But because people usually ignore the effect of memory on instructions, instructions are mostly sequential, they have very high locality rate, they are separate in their cache, very well optimized anyway, right? They don't worry too much about it, and most of the focus is related to the data handling in the, of the memory. Does this answer your question? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that, the thrashing, the eviction of another line that might be needed, right? Yeah, that's a good question. This is what I said in, in today's earlier morning lecture about some processors, in fact, most of the recent ones, gives you the ability to bypass the cache for certain data 
that you know as a programmer or from the compiler perspective that they are never revisited afterwards. For example, it's uh, sometimes we call this a streaming data. Like if you watch a video, for example, uh, most likely by the time you watch that, like you reach the end of the video, if you are streaming, you will not be coming back to the first bucket again, right? In fact, if you wanted to rewatch the video, by the time of the end of the video, the amount of backers the data you brought would have already removed the ones that you needed anyway, right? So in that case, it's better not to cache that, right? Good. Let's answer your question. Um, okay, so we see now FIFO, LRU, and random replacement policies. We understand what is, why do we need a replacement policy? Uh, because your cache has a finite capacity and you want to bring in more lines that you can afford, right? Uh, and how to handle them. Questions? I don't know how to interpret that silence. <laughs> so this mean like, okay, we get it. That's, that seems fine, trivial, or you know what? I don't know. But anyway, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, so this is the last one. It's, it's called the Villadi algorithm. It's, it's an Oracle, it's an optimal one, which is basically replace the plot that will be used further in the future. So because we don't have the future, we will only use it as an optimum point that the closer you are to the Villadi algorithm, the better you are, right? So it's, it's only your envelope, performance envelope that you are trying to get closer to, right? And then there are other approximations to LRU, including NMRU, but you don't have to worry too much about those. Okay, so here we discuss LRU. There is a working example with the ages. We already did this. We already discussed associativity and performance, which is good. Yeah, so now there is, there is two remaining topics to discuss about Catlin. One is related to the actual circuitry, the actual implementation, and the other one related to how do we handle writes. If you remember the three questions we had, one of them was how do we handle writes, right? Because writes are kind of special into how to address their, their way of handling in caches, which as we'll see uh, later on. But before this, as part of the discussion we had earlier, if we had that block, let me see if I have that figure here, yeah. So we said you have your cache, Right? This is your data cache. And then you also have your tag array. Right? This is data array is storing the actual data I'm looking for. And there is another SRAM user storing the tag. And the usage of the tag is, we said, the story, CPU issues a loading instruction, for example. I extract the index pets, go to the particular location, whether it's set associative or not. So, for example, set associative cache. I need to start from the beginning, the first way, and go through all the ways, compare the tag, look into the valid bed, see whether it's there or not, right? If it's a head, then I take, using the offset, I take the byte I'm looking for, go to the CPU. If it's a mess, what does it mean a mess? All the ways I compared, I didn't find it. I need to go and fill it from the lower level, right? This is a story we discussed so far. Now, there are some optimizations that can be done into reducing that search time, your head latency, basically. Because in the reality, if you think about it, and you, you wear your 3 you hat for optimizing circuitry, uh, the idea is that if I have a four-way set associative cache, do I really need to search sequentially? Compare the tag for the first way, if it's a mess, compare the second, or compare the third or the fourth? Or there's an alternative that in reality, if I don't care too much about the comparator, like overhead of an area, I can compare all the four ways in parallel. Right? I can say, I have the tag of my address, I have the tag of all the four ways, just do four comparison, comparisons at once. Right? The good thing about this, improves the head delay a lot because you only do the effectively, it's the time of one comparison. The drawback is the area overhead, right? So this is called the parallel tag comparison. In reality, all current machines do, do compare the tags in parallel, right? Uh, if you have a reasonable number of ways, good. Um, but in reality, they, do, they even go further. Like they say, okay, right now, if I only access the data. So what, what you do, assume you do all the comparisons in parallel. So I reduce my comparison time. But still, the steps that I need to do is to compare the tag. And if it's a hit, in that case, you access the data array. Right? So you, you first access the tag array, which is this SRAM for the tag. And if you hit in any of the tag 
bits, like any of the ways, you access the data array, which means accessing the data array sequentially is done only at the stage after the tag array, right? So you only compare the tags, and if you match, you access your data array, which is logical, right? But still it adds a dependency latency, right? First compare, and then you match, you access this. Uh, then we will try to really optimize. To, this is called the serial tag access. Serial because you only access the tag, and if you match, you access the data array. Good? The good thing about this is, well, I guess, first of all, this is intuitive. It makes sense. I don't need to access the data array if I don't match anyway. It's a waste of time. But the problem is that it's still slow, right? It's slow because I need to do these two steps in the critical path, right? Another more optimistic, more aggressive way is to say, no, in reality, I access the tag and the data in parallel, right? The, the easiest way to think about this is a direct map cache, where you need to do only one comparison. You say, instead of saying, I have, I have the index, go compare the tag bits. If they match, go and access the data array. There is no need to wait. What I do is I access the tag, and I access the data array in parallel. I bring in the data anyway. It, and later on, if I determine that the tag matches, great. I saved my data access time, because I already got the data. If it doesn't match, what do I do? just throw in the data, I didn't do anything, and then go and bring it from the memory. Why this is something that you can think is, is an advantage for performance perspective? Because these two steps that I have done one after the other, like in one stage and then do this in the second stage, right now I have done both in parallel, tag access, data access. So I saved this time, which in fact shrinks the, the, the head time. Right? What is the disadvantage? But yeah, if you cannot really hide this completely, like if this takes a little bit more time than the tag access, that's correct. You basically wasted some extra time. But there is, even if they, they, they don't add any extra delay, assume, for example, this is completely hidden by this. Because what you say is dependent on, now it's a pure digital design discussion, is that dependent on how much time this takes, this block versus this block. There is a possibility that the tag access takes this much time, while the data access takes only small time, or the other way around. If the other way around, then you are correct, because in the second solution, I still need to wait for the data access if it takes more, but in the first time, I don't wait for it. So I save my time, the, which is a possibility. It's in fact the common case, that's correct. But even if, assume, even if that was the case, which is the data access time is completely hidden by the tag access, or they're equal. So I don't pay extra time cost. I still wasted something or not. Well, in reality here, I'm, I'm shrinking in the critical band, right, for the head. This is the, this is the whole advantage of trying to access the data in parallel to the tag check. Don't wait for the tag check, but go and bring in that line no matter, because if it turns out to be a head, then you already got your data. Think about if it's a mess, right? You compare the tag and it's a mess. You already access this data array, and this data is used. So you already did effort, work, in your circuitry, that is not used. What is the implication of this? It's power consumption. It's more energy, right? I did effort. I did work that I just threw in a way, right? You, you, you basically consume more power, but then it ended up being more useful. If your miss rate is 10%, you access your data array 10% of the time uses, right? So you waste really a, consider a very considerable power, right? For no reason, right? That's the disadvantage, right? In addition to if you add extra delays because of the data access, that's also another reason, right? Makes sense? So for the parallel access, uh, well, this main disadvantage is related to, to the point we were having here is in reality, if I don't have a direct map cache and I have a set associative cache, and bringing in more lines is even more problematic from the power perspective, but also afterwards, I need to add a max stage to big from the ways that I have brought. Like, for example, if I have a four-way set associative cache and I'm doing the tag lookup in parallel, what are steps that I'm doing? Extract your index sets, go to the tag, bring in all the tags, compare them in parallel, which is fine, we discussed earlier, but on the same time, in parallel, use this index and bring in all the four ways in that set and read them, right? If you only have one read board, in reality, you're going to be doing four memory accesses four reads at, at one time, right? So why this solution, in fact, is not implemented mostly in set of switch caches. Only direct map caches really have an advantage when you do this, because it's only one line that you bring in, right? 
and then you bring in four lines, then based on which one of those matches, if any, you take that line. Make sense? If none of them matches, you just throw in all of these. Okay? Why I'm trying to do all of this? The ultimate target is to reduce the head latency. Because in reality, if it matches, you reduce your head delay to only the tag lookup. Right? Because once you do the tag lookup, you just dig the line, which is one level max, and then you have your data. Good? Questions? This is called the parallel tag and data access. And then again, we are adding the flavor of computer architecture, which is for set associated cache, I told you, well, in reality, it's very hard to bring in four ways. Direct map is the best solution. What do I do in a multi, like in a set associated cache or full associated cache? And instead of bringing all the four ways, you just predict away. How do I protect? It's based on the history, right? So we have what we call a way predictor that basically bring in one line that you think if you had is going to be this data and you use, right? Okay. Okay, good. So related to what we discussed for uh, misses and hits. So simply, we have four types of what we call cache misses. This is called miss classification. Throughout the examples we have done, in fact, we faced some of them, right? At the very beginning, for example, we said the cache is empty, right? Like at, at the beginning of the program or where, where your system boots up, everything in the cache is garbage, right? So there's nothing in the cache. In that case, any access will be a mess regardless of what you do, right? Because well, there is no locality yet. I'm just trying to get the program running, right? This is called compulsory messes or cold messes. The reason is this is just your starting point, right? But then... This is less of a focus because, well, this just happens naturally. It's not related totally to the architecture, not related to optimizations. People usually don't think of reducing, right? But then we have what we call a capacity mess. What is a capacity mess? Think of an example where I have a full associative cache that has four lines, for example, and then I have access to, let's say I have an array, just give you a more practical example. I have an array that has 10 elements. And in reality, in, in the lab, you are going to go through this part, which is you will see uh, for the capacity mess, we are increasing the array size, starting from something that is less than the cache size, then keep increasing it and see what happens, right? The idea is, assume you have a full associative cache, just to ignore the impact of conflicts from direct map. But you have a data structure that is in nature larger than the size of the cache itself, right? So in that case, what's going to happen is that if you have loops through this one, by the time you reach the end of the array and you try to come back to the beginning of the array, you have already evicted it. Why did you evict it? I don't have enough space. So the more I move forward in my array, I evict the old one, right? So if the data structure size is larger than the, the cache size, even if you have a full associative cache, then they start evicting each other. And this is called a capacity mess. It's called the capacity mess because it's, it's a mess that is caused only because you have a limited size cache. Make sense? Good. On the other hand, there is another type of mess that you are also exploring in the lab that is called a conflict mess. This is more related to the associativity of the cache, the organization of the cache. And the example we had in uh, last week where we had two ca cache lines that keep being bonging in one way while all the cache is empty. Well, right now my cache is empty. So if you look into that example, I have something like A and then B and then A and then B. And assume A and B, it's a direct mapped cache. Both are mapped to location zero. I bring in A first and then I bring in B. I have to affect A and then I remove B and then bring in A. Why this is called a conflict mess? Because it's a mess that is caused because of the associativity of the cache. Two lines are conflicting on the same entry despite the fact that my rest of the cache is empty. So you still have locations in your cache, but the problem is that those lines are mapped to the same place. So it's called a conflict mess. Okay? If your associativity is too low, usually you will cause conflict misses. Like the example that we have here is being bonding, the valid map cache. Once we started increasing our associativity, set associative or fully associative, we are fine. Right? The last mess, which is the more advanced one, it's related to coherence. 
it's a topic that I hope we would have one lecture at the end to try to talk about. But so far, we're talking about a cash hierarchy that is only receiving requests from one core, right? But at the very beginning, we said we have a system on a chip where there might be core zero and core one that are sharing, for example, an L2 or L3. In that, and they have a private cache here, L1 and L1. A very brief example is the following. Assume core zero issues a load request to A. And assume A had a value of 10 in the L2, which means in the L0 of core zero, L1 of core zero, A will have the value of 10. Then another access from core one is also loading A in the private cache. And then in that case, core one, L1 will also have a value A equal 10. Right now, if I look into these two private caches, both have cache A in the private cache, correct? So here core zero in the L1 would have a value of A equal 10, and core one in the private cache will have a value of A equal 10, right? Later on, I might have a store instruction from core zero. So I have something like core zero, store A, both the value of 100. There. If you think about it, this is a store. It's a normal memory request. It goes to the L1. Is it a miss or a head? It's a head because the cache line is already there, right? So if it's a head, what do I do? Just right over there, change the 10 to 100. What is the problem with core one? It has a stale data right now, old data, which means it needs to invalidate it, right? So in other words, if multiple cores share cache lines, they might not evict each, each, each other cache lines, but rather invalidate it, right? So Later on, if core one tries to access it, it will be a mess instead of head. Why? Because core zero has already updated. This is called a coherence mess. Because it's a mess that is caused not by anything related to your own cache organization, not a compulsory mess, not a capacity, not a conflict mess. It's because another core has already changed this data and you have to invalidate it. Good? Coherence is a, is a big advanced topic in architecture and I hope we can have one lecture then talking about it. But for now, you need to know that there are four types of misses. Compulsory, capacity, conflict, coherence, and every one of them has a reason that is different than the other. Good? Okay, great. So, as a summary, there is three main topics we discussed so far related to the organization of the cache that we also touch in the lab. There is associativity, right? The good thing about associativity is that if I increase it, I decrease the conflict messes, but the disadvantage is I increase the hit rate, right? It's already discussed. The block size, the cache line size, if I increase, I basically decrease the compulsory misses or increase the special locality. But on the other hand, I'm also increasing the conflicts as we discussed in, to, in today's lecture in the morning, right? Because you have less number of entries, so you, you increase the eviction, right? With the capacity, if I have a larger cache, well, I decrease capacity misses, but because it's a larger cache, I need to search more, so I increase the, the team, right? So these are the three main design decisions, the design factors of a cache, and how do they impact uh, the average equation? Questions? Okay, so there is one related topic, or one remaining topic in caches, which is how do we handle writes, which is the third question we had on the board last time. But I guess in uh, tomorrow's lecture, this is what we're going to cover, okay? So I will stop here. For the very first time, I give you four minutes back. So thank you, and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you.